Welcome to Den Talks, the podcast where you can pull inspiration from someone else's journey of self-discovery. This is Tal, and I had the honor of sitting with Christian Picciolini, who is a leader of the Chicago Skinheads by age 16. Yeah, the Chicago Skinheads, you heard me right. I mean, this guy was filled with hate at 16, but this conversation totally digs into his entire transformation and how he is the man he is today, this big, soft, lovable teddy bear who is all tatted up, but is now the co-founder of a nonprofit peace advocacy organization called Life After Hate. I love this conversation. It honestly just reminds you we are all layered human beings. And what's really cool about this is there's no way you can't listen to him speak and not gather the strength to start seeing the good in yourself and your true potential. He speaks so honestly about who he is now, who he was, but yet who he always has been. Make sure you stay tuned for Christian's personal practice at the end of the podcast. He's going to read an inspirational passage from his book, White American Youth. And you can honestly meditate on it and contemplate about it. It's pretty amazing. But we're talking to Christian Picciolini. Did I say that correctly? Correctly. You know, a man who's worn many hats in his 40 plus years. His birthday was last week. So happy birthday. Thank you. You know, he's a musician, an author, business owner, has been a business owner, father, has been executive producer, Emmy winner. Yeah. Emmy winner, speaker, founder of Life After Hate Foundation, and also was the leader of a white supremacist skinhead organization when you were just 16. 14. 14. 14, yeah. Well, I became was the, the leader at 16. I became a leader at 16. Okay, right. right. Yeah, I was recruited at 14. 14. He was born in Illinois to Italian immigrants and was shuttled between Blue Island, a working class Italian neighborhood on the edge of Chicago, and Oak Forest, as you refer to it, a hoity toity kind of, you know, suburban American hell suburban hellhole hell American <laughs> dream. Yeah. And you were shuttled between the two because your parents were fighting for the American dream and you were raised That's mostly right. by your grandparents. You never really felt like you fit in either location, correct? No, I felt like an outsider. Yeah, you were, you know, you went to school in one but didn't belong there, and then you didn't go to school in the other where you probably belonged, so you actually didn't know anybody, so you were constantly yeah. looking in. Mm -hmm. And so you felt really out of place, lonely, and also abandoned by your parents, as you said in your book. Um, and you were searching to be seen, and my favorite that you said, which I want to talk about later, to matter. Mm -hmm. And after a few fights and discovering that violence and fear actually could lead to respect, and a few influential people walking into your life, by the time... You were 14, and then 15, you were meshed with the Chicago skinheads, and then by 16, you were actually their leader. Yeah. So one thing I want to start with before we kind of dig into the nitty-gritty of, like, the emotion and the empathy, which you and I have already started talking about, is, and I don't mean to make light of this situation at all, but you are an unbelievably accomplished person, and you were accomplished by the time you were 16. And again, it might not be for the most worthy of causes in hindsight. Mm -hmm. However, I do think it's noteworthy that... You were a doer from the minute you were born. You were you were always like you said. You knew you wanted to have purpose and to matter, yeah. and you you even said it at least at one point a couple times in your book. I'll make it happen. Like you give me an idea, I'm going to make it yeah. happen. But you knew that back then. I knew at a very very young age that I was ambitious. That I wanted to do more than the status quo. I would sit in my grandparents' coat closet. They had this giant coat closet. Uh, and I was so lonely that I would just sit there and I would draw and sketch out like these hotel plans at seven years old where I wanted movie theaters and restaurants and all these things, probably never even having stayed in a hotel at that point in my life. Uh, I was always very ambitious. I thought, and smart. Well, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think growing up, I thought I was really stupid. Um, but I knew that I had, you know, like I was capable of more, but I, you know, my impression of myself was always very low. I had low self-esteem. I did feel abandoned by my parents, even though they were amazing people who loved me a lot. I didn't understand that, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, why they weren't there. And I thought, you know, what did I do to push them away? You, Looking back now, of course, get I get it. it. I get it. You know, I've got my own kids and, you know, I work hard and you can't always be there for them. But, you know, it was tough. It was tough growing up in a in a place where I didn't know what my identity was or my community or even my purpose. And so in, in the struggle of looking for that, and you were, I mean, when you do read your story and even in talking to you, you are, you're still ambitious. We were talking earlier on how your favorite thing is you create, you strategize, and then you like to walk away and see it happen, which means it. you have an ability to do that constantly. Mm -hmm. For some people, they're lucky and are very fortunate to do that once in their life. But yeah. the fact that you're probably doing it on a daily basis is pretty amazing. It's kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time, you know. I mean, I'm always, I'm always thinking, uh, and I love that. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's 
tough to get stuff done because you're always moving from one thing to the next and never really putting, you know, the proper attention into some things that probably could be really great. Uh, but the, the things that I am passionate about, I do dive headfirst in. And I think that that was one of the reasons that was my downfall at 14 years old. So that's what I was about to say. So because you did actually give that attention. So Everything, let's yeah. talk about it for a second, because I do find it interesting. I mean, again, you I, I want to emphasize you became their leader. You weren't just it wasn't a teenager who was just influenced by like an ugly crowd. And then you had a few bad years of like getting into fights. And so, it wasn't that like you you took advantage you saw ahead. Mm -hmm. The actual leader went to jail. You were only 15 at the time, I think, 14. Yeah, the man who recruited me uh, was America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader. And he recruited me in an alley uh, when I was 14. Uh, I was smoking a joint and he came up to me and he said something that changed my life, even though I had no idea what the heck he was talking about. <laughs> uh, he, you know, he grabbed the joint from my mouth as I was smoking it. And he said, that's what the Jews and the communists want you to do to keep you docile. I didn't, you know, 14 years old. I didn't know what a Jew or a communist was. I didn't even know what the word docile meant. <laughs> but it was the first time in my life that somebody, you know, showed me some attention and I had some value. Uh, and he drew me in based on, you know, broken promises. And then later, about a year and a half later, he went to prison for a really serious crime. Um, and luckily they were arrested, he and, and several of the other people, but unlucky for me, I, you know, I was kind of the last man standing at that point. You, but you saw an opportunity. I did. I was always an entrepreneur. I always, yeah. you know, I always, my parents were entrepreneurs uh, with a small business. And I thought growing up that that's just what you did. You didn't go work for somebody else. You kind of ran the business yourself. But at, like by 16, you, you'd established, and don't forget, this is a day there's no internet. There's right. no Facebook ads. Yeah, there's no, the this is you actually like sending mail, waiting every day by a mailbox, like doing your research, like visiting school. I mean, you PO created boxes. a business. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was networking and social uh, media before the internet. I mean, we were sending letters to P.O. boxes. We were spreading propaganda just like memes are spread, you know, on the Internet today and uh, turned it into a business, you know, not a money making business, but started a band, even recognizing that that was a powerful marketing medium to spread. So is that why you start? Because that's what's so interesting. I mean, I know I ran through the list earlier, yeah. but that's also part of it, too. You're like, oh, we're going to be a band and we're going to be famous and we're going to be known. And you that's what you said. You had no musical talent at that point None. that you knew of like None. you didn't play yeah. an instrument still <laughs> but and you were like we're gonna do it and you started writing music and yeah. it's true and then you're in europe i mean everything you said you wanted to do you executed and did it successfully unfortunately your powers were not necessarily being used for good right yeah no i mean if had i used my powers for good at that time uh who knows what, what i'd be doing right now it's really interesting uh, but yeah, back then I was always very ambitious. I was always very kind of innovative and forward thinking. But unfortunately, I was, you know, in the wrong headspace to do that. So when it's interesting, because I do want to talk about how much of you being kind of recruited and you finding yourself or maybe not even finding yourself, but being with this group yeah. was actual hatred or just the anger that you were feeling internally towards Good your parents question. and towards life. Because I do find it interesting. And, you know, before we kind of started rolling today, we were also talking about the nuance of human beings with all the sex scandal stuff of just people right. do really bad things, but that doesn't mean every layer of their soul is a bad human being. So That's correct. I want to chat about that a little bit because I find it interesting because even when you were recruited, the day you were in the alley, mm -hmm you were saying like you had just started making friends. Like your life was actually starting to pick up and turn around. So the things you were wanting were actually starting to happen without even right. this influence. So what about it was so intoxicating and overpowering? And what part of you th actually thinks it touched on beliefs you had or just filled emotional like holes? Well, I, you know, I wasn't raised on racism at all. It wasn't part of my family DNA. Uh, it was actually the opposite. I mean, my parents are Italian immigrants and mm -hmm. When they came to the U.S., they were often the victims of prejudice. And, and uh, Did you see it? You know, I, I think I felt it. Yeah. I mean, I definitely felt it having grown up in two very culturally different environments. You know, the Italian neighborhood where I would spend every day after school uh, not fitting in because I didn't come from that neighborhood. And then in the very non-ethnic white neighborhood where I was, you know, the weird foreign kid. <laughs> right. So, you know, I never really, and then, and then of course I get carted off every day after school and was never able to make friends there. So I never knew what my identity was. I didn't know if I was Italian. I didn't know if I was American. I didn't, 
you know, I felt powerless, really. And then in that alley that day, uh, when that man approached me, it was as if, even though what he said, you know, about communists and Jews uh, didn't make any sense to me, it was as if he was giving me like some secret knowledge that adults knew or that cool people knew that I didn't know. And I saw it uh, as a way to be a part of a new family because that's what I was searching for. But more so than that, a purpose. I wanted to change the world. Uh, what kid doesn't, you know, like young people are idealistic. They want to, to make a change. And I thought at that point that I was doing the right thing because it wasn't pitched to me as hate. It was pitched to me at first as pride. Right. You know, he's, interesting. He's, he saw my vulnerabilities, uh, which is, you know, very savvy from a recruiter standpoint. They, they zero in on, on a person's vulnerabilities and cracks, and then they fill them in with broken promises. So for me, I felt abandoned. So he knew that I needed acceptance. Uh, and he drew me into a family. Uh, he knew I needed an identity because I was struggling with who I was. And he, and he fed that pride. He said, you're Italian. You know, you should be proud of your ancestors. They were great philosophers and artists and, you know, thinkers and all this thing. And I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds great. Because all I knew was being Italian. I lived in a very small Italian bubble. Uh, How important but, do you, th sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and then eventually it, it, the rhetoric ramped up and, you know, it turned into that pride that you feel. Somebody wants to take that away from you and you have to act. Right. It's fear rhetoric. How, how much, how important do you think identity is for a human? Oh, gosh. I think that identity, community, and purpose are probably our most fundamental needs. We need to know who we are, who our people are. Uh, and that could be a small community or it could be a large community. And I think we're all driven by how we see our purpose in the world. It's just interesting because, as you were saying, as a kid, though, how many children know what their identity they is? Don't. I mean, identity changes. We all know that. We sure. were also talking about that earlier. Your identity itself can change many times. But I guess a lot of what we talk about on this show in general is knowing who you are truly so that... All the hats you wear, like all the many hats you have, they can change interchangeably. Sure. You can constantly strategize something new. But if you're the same person, that's all bonus. That's right. just kind of the flourish. Those are like the petals on your flower exactly. versus just who you actually are. So, I mean, I'm almost jumping forward, but it was so interesting when you were saying that it's just in order to matter an identity, how do you think, what do you do with that with children? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to, we need, I think we're failing young people to a large degree. Uh, we need to support their passions. We need to hear them. You know, young people like to be heard. They don't like to be talked to. And frankly, even though we're young and, you know, we may have kids, we're still out of touch with what they need because, you know, every person's different and what works for us doesn't work for them. So when we identify the passions and uh, the things that young people love to do, I think we need to foster them and amplify them. Uh, you know, if there's a seven year old who wants to who loves to build things, I think that we need to somehow find a way to include them in the programs or groups that do that kind of stuff so that they can you know, meet other people that are like that and don't feel excluded. Um, you know, when I was in the movement and you asked me earlier, you know, was it true hatred that I really hate people at that point? I thought I did. But, you know, I have the luxury of being away from that movement for 22 years and looking back. And knowing that really, for me and for everybody else that I knew, it was self-hatred that I was projecting onto right. other people. I was so angry uh, and so frustrated with myself that I didn't want to feel my pain, so I put it on others. And I had to make them feel worse than I did so that I could feel better about myself. Now, could you ever decipher the message? Like, were there ever moments of clarity for you? Because you were, you were smart. And like, oh, yeah. and again, you write your book, like you said, in hindsight, it's 2020. You have right. the ability to look at it through a different vision. Right. But I mean, there were moments you said that, you know, I think, and I, I wrote it down, like in 1989, there were moments that you literally were feeling guilt of the rhetoric you were pouring down people's mouths. You were feeling anxiety for the constant, yeah. you know, violence that was around you. So that's very aware. Now, was were you actually feeling those things in the moment or was that yeah. the hindsight kind of? No, I was feeling, I mean, I had doubts the whole eight years that I was involved uh, because it wasn't, I, I adopted this identity to fit in. Uh, you know, I had gone from this powerless, bullied, uh, you know, kid that was essentially invisible to now this person who was powerful and feared and, and you know, kind of the scourge of the city. Uh, and that was intoxicating for me. 
Um, so even though I had these moments of clarity where I felt guilt and I knew it wasn't part of who I was, but I still continued to do things, it was because I, uh, that belonging in that respect, perceived respect, was more important to me at the time than you know, how I was hurting other people. I didn't even... Did you even know that you were hurting other people at that point? You know, there were moments where I did. Uh, But I think by and large, I I didn't. I I thought I was feeding, you know, I was nourishing myself. Now, did you... It's That's interesting that you were nourishing yourself. So you were... I was really destroying myself, but yeah, I thought... And you said later that you were, there were like, you were committing many suicides on a daily... Suicide in daily increments. Yeah, I thought that was an amazing statement. Thank you. And do you feel like that's kind of what you mean? It's like you didn't even... Yeah. And was there a duality to you where part of you was tortured because you knew you were doing that? I don't think I knew that at that time. Uh, I think I knew that I was doing... I definitely knew I was doing bad things and I had remorse for it, but the remorse wasn't strong enough to to overpower my need to to be seen. Um, But yeah, I mean, I definitely... I didn't think at the moment that I was committing suicide in daily increments. I thought that you were the, growing. I thought that I was moving forward and that yeah. the world was creating was, you know, committing suicide in daily increments. And I was on the good side and I couldn't understand why people didn't, you know, see it my way. But I was living in a bubble that uh, was smaller than the average bubble because, you know, I only surrounded myself with other a broken. bubble in a bubble in a bubble. Yeah. And it was a broken bubble with, you know, broken people in it. Uh, everybody looking for the same thing, belonging. And for most of us, if not all of us, it was the first time we had, we had any kind of purpose, good or bad. Now, you know, you said earlier that you were a little bit different than a lot of the other broken people in the sense that you weren't raised to talk, you weren't taught to hate at all. And you were actually provided for their parents might not have been around, but you were provided for versus some people weren't at all. Do you think in looking at you know, those who are either still enmeshed in this movement, that that's part of your ability of why you could ultimately come out of it? Yeah, I think having a strong foundation, uh, I was very fortunate to have that because it did allow me to to get back out. Um, You know, people go into these movements not because of ideology or dogma. That's not what radicalizes people. Uh, I think that it's a broken search for identity, community, and purpose. And then accepting the dogma. Yeah, you know, we all have uh, something I call potholes, those things that kind of appear in our path that deviate us. Uh, And if we don't have the right support uh, or the right resources to navigate around those potholes in our life's journey, sometimes we're forced to be detoured down really dark roads where we can get lost. Um, And my job for the last 20 years has, has become to be a pothole filler for people. You're a pothole filler. Uh, I'm a pothole filler. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So I listen, you know, I, when I work with folks to help them disengage, because that's what I do now, uh, is I don't argue with them. I don't debate them. I don't tell them they're wrong, even though I want to, because I know that they are. Instead, I listen, and I listen for the potholes. Uh, and those things could be trauma, could be um, untreated mental health conditions, it could be chronic unemployment, could be extreme privilege even. And what I do is is I provide services for human resiliency so job training or education or life coaching or meditation or even uh, tattoo removal because when people feel more self-confident when they have when they feel they have the skills to maybe compete in the marketplace because they've lost a job they have less of a reason to blame the other Uh, this imaginary you know demon that's taking something from them but I do challenge their ideology. I, I'll introduce them to people that they think that they hate. So I've spent hours with Holocaust deniers and Holocaust survivors and Islamophobes and, uh, you know, really welcoming Muslim families and imams. And suddenly that connection, because 9.9 times out of 10, they've never had a meaningful interaction with the people that they hate. Uh it's interesting and, and fascinating how the demonization suddenly starts to become humanization. Yeah. Well, I mean, I thought that was interesting, too, when you were smack in it. I mean, you were already a leader. You were also on the football team. Yeah. So this is why I keep Talk going about. back to it, because I feel like there's such a duality with you. And there that's was. and what I like to kind of discuss is like you your your underbelly of who you are was always there. Like you said, it was just covered your yeah. potholes being filled with something just darker yeah. at the time. So here you were on this football team and you guys were kicking ass and you were doing well and yeah. you were playing with 
with African Americans and Latinos, and I mean the team was split about a third either way. And on the football field, we were brothers. We were brothers. We were teammates. We didn't see color except for you know the the helmets and the uniforms we were wearing, and uh, that respect was evident even in the locker room, even with you know my tattoos and things like that. And they elected me the captain of the football team, knowing what I was about. And when you would look at them on the football field, what would you see? I would see a team, a family. And uh, when the helmets came off, it was different. I went back to my other family, uh, which I think is important to note because I was always chasing that acceptance. And it didn't matter which family it was. I was loyal to them. Uh, And I always joked that, you know, had ballerinas lived across the alley when I was 14, I probably could have been the greatest ballet dancer on earth, though you don't want to see me dance. (laughs) Uh, But instead, it was, you know, America's first neo-Nazi skinhead that that walked in front of me and uh, and changed my life forever. So so that's so it's interesting. So with circumstance, like you said, ballerinas, if you were on the football team earlier, mm-hmm. do you think that would have changed? Like, do you think sports would have become a bigger influence for you? Yeah. I was actually a really good athlete. I was scouted. I went to, you know, college uh, uh, training camps and things like that. And this movement actually destroyed that for me. Had I, uh, had I saw football or sports as, as more of an accepting, um, you know, family for me, I, I definitely would have gone that way. So you're a big proponent of sports, like team team building, team, team sports. Yeah, like, team building. I mean, you know, sports, I think, are, the version are, of it. Yeah, are a great way. Uh, you know, you, I, I love soccer. Soccer is absolutely my favorite sport, European soccer. Interesting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it really takes 11 people on the field to play chess mm-hmm. uh, against the other team to win. And those people are different colors from different countries, different religions, and they work together like a machine and they respect each other on the field. Um, and that's important to me, the sports part. I mean, the aggression and things like that, you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of, but I love seeing pieces come together and work together. And that's kind of what I try to do now is I try to make really strange pieces work together. I love that. And you know what? And again, we've always said everything we all do in our life does lead up to something. So, I mean, yes. So long as we learn along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're learning, it all makes sense in the long run. I mean, we all make mistakes. It's just what do you learn from them? But so, again, in talking about the humanity, let's talk about the few things you feel like pulled you out of it. Mm -hmm. For me, one of the things that stood out, which I guess would make sense because you're talking about abandonment and wanting family and a belong was love. Yeah. Like at the core of it, I think when true love was penetrating you, you'd break down a little bit. So interesting enough, your mom and your brother, Alex, but you called him buddy and you mm-hmm. called each other buddy, um, always seemed to be your soft spots when yeah. you were going through it. Like even though you were angry, I mean, the moments at least that I read about, and I'd love to talk about them a little bit, they always were the ones that gave you pause not enough to get you to stop but enough to give you pause yeah i I always was resentful of my father because i I feel like i didn't see him the most so that's why you were more angry at him yeah i don't know i mean i just i think i really he loves me and i loved him and i still do and i still remember him being around much when i was a kid my mother was around more um and i was closer to her uh, and I always felt a soft spot for her because I knew how much she cared about me and how much this hurt her when I was doing it. Um, but I was also resentful against my parents. So part of it was acting out against them because I was angry. And then my brother, I mean, I was an only child for most of my life. And then when I was 10, you know, my brother was born, whether by mistake or not. Uh, and I felt he was the first person because I was lonely at 10 years old. It was as if, you know, he was, I had a connection with him and he was like my little doll or my little best friend because I didn't have very many friends. But then, you know, quickly after that, when I was 14, I had started to, to get involved with this neo-Nazi skinhead movement. And I started to kind of abandon my brother the same way that my parents abandoned me. I left for, you know, this, what I thought was the American dream at the time, you know, to, to run this movement, this business. And, uh, and I grew distant from my brother, which, you know, who was the only person I was very close with growing up. So funny. I mean, I'm sure, cause you're a musician, you know, this song cast in the cradle by Cat sure. Stevens, which sure. always makes me cry for my relationship with my dad. <laughs> yeah. But it was interesting when I first read about you and buddy, like early in the book, I actually wrote that down because mm. that's what it seemed like the kid who just kept asking, but it was you and him, not him and his dad. It yeah. was, it was that cycle where he was like, 
can't we play? You want to do this. I yeah. want to do this. And then, no, not time. We'll do it later. Not time. We'll do it later. And then later kind of ran out. And then later ran out. Yeah. Um, but I, it always made, I found it so interesting that that relationship was like your, it was like you were a parent to him. I mean, obviously yeah, at such a young age. It's interesting that you say that. I mean, I never thought of it that way, but I really was. And I almost mimicked what my parents had done to me with him. Uh, yeah. I mean, the story with my brother was that he really, really wanted, he looked up to me a lot. And, you know, growing up, he was really my only friend. And when he needed somebody, that's when I started to get involved with other things. And I, you know, abandoned him. And as I tried to come back later, when I left the movement, and I realized what I had done, uh, that I, you know, hadn't spent quality time with my brother. Uh, by that time, it was a little bit too late. He had gotten involved with some people maybe to try and live up to my legacy somehow because um, everybody knew who I was. And I think for him, he wanted that same kind of attention and he got involved with some folks that, you know, maybe didn't have the greatest intentions. Um, and uh, one day he was in a car and they were out and about and uh, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and, and he was killed. He was murdered. And I never had the chance to really kind of come full circle to help him. Hmm. Like I wished I could have, you know, been helped. And maybe that's why I help other Everybody people. else. That's probably a huge impetus for you. Yeah. Does he, um, yeah, it's, how did you, I know that you were telling a story in the book too of when you were still enmeshed in it and there was a moment where he came in and he held up a doll and said, look, mm, yeah. You know, and he said, look, this, I, I, I don't want to repeat the word. Yeah, yeah. the N-word, a, a dead N-word, um, proudly. Mm -hmm. I think probably, like you said, looking for your approval because he was so desperate for your approval. Mm -hmm. In that moment, again, and you were in it at that point, this is in hindsight, like, what were you proud? Were you ashamed? Were you, were you proud that your little brother was trying to be you? Were you at that point, was there awareness? Where were you? Yeah, I think I was around 16 years old and he was about six. Uh, and he had brought out, I was in an argument with my parents about something. Uh, and he had brought out this action figure of a, of a wrestler, a WWF wrestler called Junkyard Dog. Oh, I know. I used to be obsessed wrestler. with WWF. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, me too. Back when I thought it was real. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, he had been listening to the words that I had been saying and, and I didn't know that. And he came out and because he wanted my attention, was very proud of the fact that he said, look, you know, buddy, here's this dead, you know, N word uh, talking about the action figure. And I don't think I was proud. I think that really hit me viscerally. I was I always was very, very careful. Even after I got married at 19 and had my own children, I was very careful that I didn't want them involved in, in what I was involved in. My wife was not a member of the movement. No, that's I fascinating never brought too. any of the ideology home. I never, you know, taught my kids, even though they were very young. That's what I'm saying. Like your underbelly knew it was wrong. It knew it was wrong. And somehow I thought I had to shoulder it for everybody and that I could go through it. Uh, because part of me still believed it was right, that it was my purpose, uh, or at least the one that I had adopted. And uh, and I think my DNA, the real me, knew what I was doing was, was you know, horrific. Now, when you talk about, you were saying when you help people now, you don't argue with them, you listen, and, you know, you don't tell them they're wrong. So when you said you were trying, when it was a little too late and you went back to Buddy and you were trying to say... You're wrong. It was is that <laughs> yeah, is that I mean, part of like what yeah. was going on? You were in I told him he was wrong for hanging out with the kids that he was hanging around with, that his life was heading nowhere. And I just approached it in in the wrong way. The way that I knew deep down inside would not have affected would incite me. Either. More anger. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, had somebody at 18 years old came up to me and told me I was wrong, uh, I would have gotten louder and I would have told him why I was right. If somebody at 18 or 17 or 16 would have came up to me and punched me in the face. I would have came back with, you know, a gun and 10 dudes. It wouldn't have changed me. It would have pushed me further away. And I think I recognize that now. And when I work with people, it doesn't matter if they're a 17-year-old girl or a 60-year-old, you know, grand dragon of the KKK, I approach them the same. I think of them as me at that time. What would have affected me? And I know that, you know, Debating is not what what would have pulled me closer. You know, getting hit in the head with a bottle of urine at a protest would have not, you know, made me not a racist. In fact, it probably would have made me more angry and more, you know, committed to the cause. 
So I really try to look at, at people as uh, not as monsters, but as broken human beings who are capable of doing monstrous things. And I mean, I think that's all of us. It's just what's the balance. I mean, everyone's balance is different, but everyone's capable of doing amazing things and yeah. horrible things. But it's easy to demonize people for the bad things Absolutely. they do. Uh, and, you know, and we were talking about kind of, you know, all this sexual assault stuff that's coming out, which is horrific. But I also think we need to realize that, uh, you know, not to not to victimize the oppressors uh, or sorry, not to make, you know, to minimize the victims and, 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 you know, work on the oppressors. But we also have to realize they're not monsters. They're broken human beings that at some point did this because there was something inside them that was unresolved and broken. And, and, and if we want to stop this racism, whatever in the future, we need to, we need to focus on that. But do you find, I mean, I agree with you and I, I mean, I say stuff like that a lot, but don't you find sometimes it's a very unpopular view? Oh yeah. And and people, I, I find sometimes people don't quite understand what you're saying and yeah. you automatically get shoved into your defending yeah. Oh, yeah. all yeah. of the perpetrators basically versus I always try and say like, no, I'm trying to actually understand people. I'm trying to understand where people are coming from, but you do, you get shoved back a little bit. I I mean, there's been people call me a Nazi (laughs) sympathizer and somebody who's trying to, you know, provide a soft cushion for them to land on. And, and I understand that this is not about ideology for most of them. This is about them acting out in ways because they hate themselves and there's something broken. And if I can help stop that, uh, I would do that with anybody. I don't care if it's Me a too. neo-Nazi or, you know, a homeless person or, you know, uh, somebody who abuses their wife. If I see an opportunity to stop that activity from happening and to help somebody become more resilient so that they don't do that in the future, I think that that's a good thing and not necessarily a bad thing. Do you wish someone did that for you? Yes. Do you think someone could have done it for you? Yes. Ha- you know, I-, I joked about the ballerinas, but, you know, if I would have had a coach came up to me who came up to me and said hey you're a good ball player why don't you you know come to this camp or you know let me work with you or if it was an you know i loved art uh i would have gone those ways in a heartbeat over you know a path of violence and hatred and anxiety and, and even though i didn't recognize that at the time uh i still loved you know like I was a 14 year old kid. I was trading baseball cards literally that week. And then I became, you know, a neo-Nazi. Uh, so yeah, I think I was screaming for attention and had somebody came to me and said, Hey, try this, think about it a different way or, or come, you know, work on this, uh, activity or your passion. And, I would have gotten more, I would have fallen more in love with that than anything else that I had done at that time. So in a world where we talk about kids today being so overscheduled and parents being yeah. a little crazy, it's funny though, in talking to you, is that necessarily a bad thing? Because in some way, I mean, it might be bad in the sense they're not finding their true identity if they're being pushed to things yeah. their parents think might be great. But are they maybe at least getting the chance to find something versus, yeah. I like what I keep hearing from you is, Unfortunately, it was the formative years. It was like before right. 14 that you just had no anchor, like zero anchor. You didn't know who you were. You didn't know your identity. Yeah. Your parents weren't around. You had no friends because you were being shuttled back and forth. You couldn't join a team because you weren't staying long enough after your school to play in one. And then you right. weren't part of the home to play in the little leagues, wherever. I mean, yeah. so you could never actually belong, even if you tried. And right. then by the time you started to, you were already, like you said, the I hole was, was so huge. Yeah, I was already starting to be resentful and angry at that time. So is there something to this overparenting? I mean, of like actually trying to make sure your kid finds something? I think that there's, you know, there's a harmony that and a balance that can be found with, you know, I was under scheduled, I think. I was pretty much on my own. Right. Uh, so I found, I didn't have a guide. Um, I think, yeah, I think we can overschedule. Uh, I think, you know, there is a problem with helicopter parents or even parents, you know, I work, when I work with people, uh, sometimes they say, you know, I was overly religious when I was young, my parents really, really pushed that on me and I wanted to go in a completely different direction. And I rebelled, you know, against Christians and I became this, you know, hateful hate monger or whatever. So I think that there, you know, parents have their hearts in the right places when we do those things because we want to create a great environment for Mm -hmm. our kids but i think we also do that in our image with our needs and And not not supporting theirs and not supporting theirs 
you know, we as parents, maybe even as white people, we tend to prescribe the answers to the solutions a lot without necessarily getting the feedback from the people who we're trying to help. Rather than being allies, we are, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, bosses or, or, you know, so innovators and solution presenters and, and instead of, you know, being collaborative and saying, hey, uh, inner city community, how can we help you instead of going in and saying, this is what we're going to do or with kids, you know, this is you're going to go to college, you're going to do this. I think we understand it's like missionaries, things. amazing exactly. heart and amazing intention is in the but right the place. Agenda is, but the is agenda is off. They don't really know what they're They're not necessarily helping. Yeah. And I don't right. think parents are necessarily, you know, trying to push an agenda, but, you know, they grew up a certain way and they have values and they want their kids to adopt those values. No, but we need to understand this is a different world. You know, kids need different things. Yeah. The internet has, ch- has changed everything. And we don't even know what that means because we weren't in it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for us, it was, everything was face to face. What I'm worried about now with young people uh, and disconnection and the internet is that you have an environment where socially and politically it's confusing. Uh, kids can't afford college. And if they can, you know, they get saddled with debt for years and years. They, there's no promise of a job once they get out. Uh, there's no clear direction or identity for our country right now. Uh, and if as an adult, I'm confused, I can't imagine what it's like for a 13, 14, 15 year old who's got to face the rest of their life in this world, how confusing it is for them. So they're looking for answers. And what the Internet is doing uh, is providing answers for them, depending on where you look. Right. But I, that's actually an interesting point, because one of the things you said also in your book that I kind of glommed on to was after you met Clark, your leader who then left, you mm-hmm. said, well, now I'm looking for evidence to support. I'm looking for evidence to support it. And I never found it. <laughs> but you thought you did. I thought it. You know, you, like yeah. you said, you'd look for even like dirty yards or your parents oh, weren't home because the Jews were keeping them, all that stuff. Right. But you were looking for it. Yeah. And there is, to me, that was a scary thought because I find that it's very easy, and we're doing it in today's society all the time, to come up with an argument. And if you were objective enough, you could probably write both sides very clearly Mm -hmm. if you're an objective human being. But that also means anyone can glom onto one side and not realize the other side exists. So I found that fascinating that you were doing that. And it made me, I was actually very excited to talk to you to say, well, what do you feel? Because let's bring some of the stuff you were going through then and bring it to modern day what's happening now. So Mm -hmm. fake news, because that's a version of fake news. You're looking to support or create whatever story and when they're telling you all these things and it was because you were listening to that punk rock music and Mm -hmm. the messaging you were saying now we're getting the true messaging not this shit they're throwing down our throats at school yeah how so even back then there was fake news it just wasn't internet so let's talk about that i mean it's dangerous and how do you know the difference and how how would you recommend people learn how can someone become objective where not only in what we were talking about before you can see all the layers of a human being, that is being yeah. objective, that is understanding that people are complicated, but in the same way, look at an argument or something happening in politics or something happening out there and know there's two sides. How do you figure out what both things mean and where does the truth lie? That's so, so relevant today, I think. And, and we did have our version of fake news back in those days, except there was printed materials and word of mouth. Uh, and when you're looking for something, you will find it. Right. If I was looking for, you know, dirty yards from African-Americans or crime, I would find it. But what I wasn't looking for was the same thing happening for, you know, from white people. So it was very easy to think, ah, yeah, you know, well, it's it's easy to blame them uh, because that's all I saw, because that's all I was looking for. We live in a time when there are two very parallel realities happening with two very different sets of facts. Um, fake news. And unfortunately, you know, because of the internet, it's rampant. It's, so it's very hard to not step in to fake news. I've been guilty of like retweeting Everybody. it or posting some, no, you know, story that I didn't do, you know, my due diligence on or thought critically about, I think we've all done that. I mean, our president has done it and he still does it. I mean, he does it always. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> so, but yeah, you know, there, are, there are definitely, uh, if we live in our bubbles, it's very easy to create, um, a perspective that you that solidifies you without having without allowing yourself to look at another one, and I always say that you know the voices on the left and the right are the loudest, but they're they're so small. And the truth is, is we all kind of float around in the middle. 
Uh, and if we start with the extremes and start arguing about what we have wrong, we never get to the middle to the commonalities that we have. If we start with our commonalities and we all, everybody in this room right now, despite not knowing each other, we all have something in common. We're all human beings. We're all Americans. We love, you know, our families. We want our kids to grow up in a safe place and have a great education and opportunity. You can go anywhere in the world. And I would, you know, if you ask somebody what the most important thing to them was, they would probably say one of those things. If we start there with those commonalities and then work out to our differences, maybe eventually we'll go off track from each other, but at least we will have established some commonality. If we start from the outsides, from the extremes, and just start arguing about what we see as different, we never get to the middle and we never experience that bond of, of you know, what we might have in common. And we don't practice empathy because of that. Everybody's going through something that we know nothing about. Yeah, I mean, it's true. We always say when you get flipped off or you're pissed and or someone does something shitty to you, it's like you don't know what their day has been. Yeah, maybe their mother has cancer or their girlfriend yeah. just broke up with them or their child, you know, was diagnosed. I mean, who knows? You never right? know. You never know. So how is this, and we don't even have to talk politics per se, but how is this since the election been for you then? Because it's it's a device yeah. of time. No matter what side you fall on, it is a device of time. And it's hard. I find if you are someone... I'll speak for myself. I've had a tricky time with it because of the divisiveness, regardless of my views. And I am a liberal and I am mm. did not vote for Trump. Right. But I do at times, you know, like I said, you get people will be like, you're a Trump supporter. I'm like, oh, God, not at all. I just right. sometimes have the ability to step back and say, hey, we're we're all in this. And sometimes the liberal side can be just as guilty as sure. the other side. We all do things like you were saying, mm. all of us. And what scares me more than anything is the divisiveness. And yeah. no matter what side is partaking in that, the more we get pulled apart, to me, that's what's been really upsetting me. And I've been watching it from both sides and getting angry on both sides for that. Um, and it's been hard. It's actually been a hard time for that reason. And like, yes, we could talk about him, but that's a whole other podcast. We yeah, don't have to yeah. do that. Um, but I do find what's more interesting are the layers underneath what's happening because of him and what's happening right. to the people. Well, you know, we live in a, in a complicated society. And I think that all these, a lot of the arguments that we're having uh, are very black and white solutions to a yes. very complex problem. And, and it's not black are, and white. Yeah. And there are so, so many layers. And unfortunately we're living in a time when, you know, re Republicans are being called Nazis and liberals are being, you know, called, you know, communists and socialists. It's crazy. And, and that's, you know, it's obviously not the truth. I mean, I think we're all proud Americans who really want to live in a, in a great country. Um, but the fear rhetoric right now is driving us apart and we're making enemies of ourselves and, and we really need each other, you know, to make this all work. Um, and we, I think we need to understand that America is not one person. It is not the president. I agree with that. America is us. And I've seen a lot of hope uh, despite the divisiveness, I've seen people come together. I've never heard the words empathy and compassion brought up, you know, in news broadcasts and in TV shows more than I That's have. That's true, now. actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're having tough discussions that I think we've avoided for many, many years. What do you think about kind of the right wing or the white supremacists, like that stuff that seems, mm -hmm. do you think it's rising or do you think they're just getting voice? I think it's both. I, you know, I think we're definitely, it's more visible now. Uh, you know, we're on a 24 hour news cycle where CNN is talking about, you know, white supremacists and white nationalists, which by the way, I hate that word because white nationalists and alt-right are words that they give themselves. It's their own marketing message. And for us to adopt that as them winning, they're white supremacists, plain and simple. And we should talk about that. And what's the difference? This is a stupid question. What's the difference between that and a neo-Nazi? Uh, not much. I mean, there are nuances to, to, you know, political beliefs, but the underlying thread with doesn't matter if you're in the KKK or a neo-Nazi skinhead or American Nazi party or alt-right or identitarian or whatever pretty word that they're giving themselves these days. Uh, because they've gotten very marketing savvy. The underlying threat is white supremacy. They they feel that they want a white homeland. Uh, and, you know, they can give themselves fuzzy names like alt-right, which seems very mainstream, which is what they're trying to do is mainstream themselves. But, you know, behind closed doors and even, you know, to the public, things that they say are, are, are white supremacist in nature. And that's even coming from, you know, a, a part of the administration as well. 
some of the things that I hear I coming out of, uh, you know, policy discussions are things that I used to say 30 years ago when I wanted to, you know, to, to ship everybody out of our country. Well, well that's, I, it's funny. I went through a list of, there's so many things that oh, yeah. you guys were doing, like between immigration, gun control, Still there's so many yeah. things I mm-hmm. feel like that you probably have very interesting opinions on having probably had one opinion that's changed. It's yeah. so like, I mean, the immigration that you were just touching on, that's a big deal. It's huge. Because that is the rhetoric that you guys would use. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, they've softened their language and made it just a little bit more palatable, I think, than the words that we used to use. Right. But I think we recognized even 30 years ago that we were turning away the average American white racist because we were waving swastikas and had shaved heads. So we decided 30 years ago to put a plan in motion where we would ditch the boots and start wearing suits, that we would grow our hair out, that we would go to college campuses, both to enroll and to recruit because we knew they were fertile grounds. We would get jobs in law enforcement and even go to the military to get training. And here we are 30 years later. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing now. It's crazy. Yeah. But it's all strategy. That's what's so fascinating. It was. It was. Yeah, it was strategy because we knew we needed to be where our potential recruits were. We needed to look like them. We needed to sound like them. And they even changed their language. You know, they're not calling it the the global Jewish conspiracy anymore. They're calling it globalism. They're not saying, you know, the Jewish owned media. They're calling it the liberal media. So they've taken, you know, they've polished the words to make it seem less hateful and more uh, easy to swallow for, you know, for the average person. Um, And it's effective and it's scary. When you look back at some of, you know, it's interesting. I was like when we were talking, you say N word now, you actually won't say it. So Mm -hmm. like when you look back to some of these things you have said, like the all it's funny you say art was one of your favorite things and you had that huge altercation with the guy in your school that got you booted out of your school for like the fifth time I think art class, yeah. um an art class when you think about the things that you uttered that came out of your mouth what what does that do to you now in present day you know I, I really have a hard time looking at that person that I used to be and thinking that it was the same person um and of course you know, I have, I still have a lot of shame uh, for the things that I did. I've forgiven myself. I've learned to do that. Um, but I still have a lot of shame over how I affected people. I planted a lot of seeds of hate 30 years ago, uh, and I'm still pulling out the weeds from them today. Um, and, you know, every time I hear of an incident, uh, like, uh, you know, a Sikh temple shooting in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, or Dylan Roof walking into a church in, in Charleston. I feel responsible for that stuff Oof. because I know I put ideas into the world that still live today, you know, and I just actually found out it's two weeks ago. Effect. This this affected me pretty deeply, but two weeks ago I found out that uh, Dylan Roof uh, in a, a neo-Nazi web forum had posted some lyrics from a band that he had heard on a HBO special. And he didn't know the name of the band, but he knew the lyrics. And somebody showed it to me a couple of weeks ago. And when I was reading them, uh, I literally felt sick to my stomach because they were my lyrics. Oh, God. And they were four months. It was four months before he committed that act. And, you know, I can't help but think that, you know, something that I put out into the world 25 years ago may have partially inspired something like that. And it's why I do the work that I do today. And, you know, I mean, it is beautiful that you're putting out so much positive energy now. I'm trying to. I'm still, you know, I know that I will never stop making amends for the things that I've done. Um, but I don't, you know, I also don't see it as amends. I see it as being a good human being. Yeah. This is who I am. Uh, I see every person that I work with as, as me when I was that kid, that broken kid uh, who, and I think everybody is redeemable. I think everybody, when faced with reality that maybe they've never faced before, uh, has the ability to change. Um, well, it's interesting because you talk about um, your son, the birth of your son when yeah. you were 19, yeah. um, changed everything. But And I'm and he did because I think you saw the purity of the soul, which I think is a lot of what yeah. you're talking about now. Everyone's redeemable because yeah. you start clean. You start yeah, fresh. We, we learn how to be, you know, the bad people. <laughs> uh, we're born completely in tune with our, you know, our surroundings and, and our family and, and other people. And we cr- when we're babies we cry until we get love you know and when we when we get love we stop crying but love it's i think and going off of your comment about love that it started early like the, it started you started defrosting if that's a word for it mm-hmm. earlier yeah. you know your first wife lisa yeah i mean 
she seems like an amazing woman and was put was given to you yeah. very specifically. If you believe that me. the world works that way. Yeah. Um, oh, I do. I mean, there's so many things that happened in my life. But you um, fell in love with a woman who yeah. was basically almost a goody two shoes and wanted to be a school teacher. Not and a racist bone in her body. No, if anything, yeah. didn't even want to date you because yeah. of what you stood for. And you pursued her and pursued her. It was kind of the first time you got a little mushy and yeah. sent her flowers. <laughs> and, um, but it's amazing. I think what amazed me in that relationship was it was pure love. Now, maybe for just that time, mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, but it was pure love. I mean, she ended up falling in love with you, the the you that you, we've been talking about, the layered you, the one that has empathy, the one that's kind, the one who wants to belong. She saw something inside of me that I didn't even see myself at the time. And she took a chance on me. And unfortunately for me, I wasn't brave enough to to realize what I had. And I got confused and I, you know, despite having this amazing wife and, you know, having a beautiful child, you know, which served to challenge my sense of identity, community and purpose. Right. Was I this hate monger or was I a father and a husband? And what do I want to teach my son? Exactly. Was my community the one that I had manufactured around me to boost my ego or the one that I'd physically given life to? And, and was my purpose to scorch the earth or to actually build a good one for my, you know, for my family? That's a lot to ponder for a 19-year-old. <laughs> it was, yeah. Which ultimately threw you into a very deep depression. It did because I lost everything. You know, uh, ultimately I ended up pulling back from the movement uh, to support my family. I didn't want to get arrested or you know go to or get killed and and have them fend for themselves. So I decided to pull off the streets, and I opened a record shop instead uh, to sell white power music. And I thought. Uh, that's a compromise, right? I can support my You're family. Slowly pulling away. Slowly. Yeah. I didn't have the courage just yet, but you know, I, I could sell this white power music and I could also support my family and stay, you know, and stay in the movement. What I didn't expect was going to happen at the store was that I was going to start to meet people that I had kept outside of my social circle. Ah, so that's what you were talking about earlier, introduce people to that you used to yeah. demonize. So everything that I do with other people are all based on things that, you know, I know worked for me and other people you know, other people I've had the luxury of talking to. People join these groups for acceptance, not ideology, and they leave because they receive compassion from the people that they least expected from. Uh, And at the store, I started to, for the first time, meet, uh, you know, African Americans and Jewish people and gay people. And I started to realize that we had more similarities, that I actually had more in common with them, uh, and that the differences that we had were, were the enhancements. It was the beauty, it was the language, the culture, the food, all things that I loved. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky enough that they saw me as a broken human being and not as a monster and they tried to help. And it's amazing because you keep, you keep referring to it. It's like, we are all love. We're born wanting love. That's what we are. Lisa gave it to you. Yeah. You know, you guys, let's talk, nature versus nurture for a second. It's interesting. So she also was raised kind of feeling abandoned, not with the parents around, but went the opposite way. Yeah. And so what, what do you think was like the difference for both of you? You both have very similar backgrounds, which is kind of one of the things that bonded yeah. you together and made you understand each other. But yet she went. I think for me, my downfall was my ambition. Uh-huh. And, you know, she was very content and caring for others. I mean, she loved children and she wanted to teach and she, you know, she was an amazing, is an amazing mother, uh, you know, to our kids. And, and that was her way to cope with feeling abandoned herself is she created her own family uh, and nurtured them to feel whole herself. Me, on the other hand, I needed people's attention and I went out and I searched for it and I needed to be nurtured. Um, I was ambitious, but I also needed to be respected. Um, And unfortunately, at that time, I, I thought the respect I was getting was true respect when it wasn't. It was fear and it was, you know all sorts of negative things. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it was a, unfortunately we were only married for four and a half years. We had two amazing kids, uh, but that four years changed. It's pivotal. Me. Yeah. It changed me. We weren't ready for each other at the time, but the situation that we put ourselves in was what we needed because it changed both of us. If you could give any advice, I'm going to ask for it on two layers. If you could go back and give advice to parents, hmm. And how to deal with kids and also advice to kids who are feeling lost. What would those two pieces of advice be? All right. Well, to parents, I would say uh, listen 
to your children or to young people, find out what it is uh, that you know, kids don't like to, they're not very open. They don't know how to communicate very well, or maybe don't feel comfortable communicating. So we need to create safe environments for them to communicate, even with authority figures like parents. And then when we hear what they're saying, uh, and sometimes we have to decipher a little bit, we need to really amplify those passions. We need to support, um, you know, like I said earlier, young people want to be heard. Uh, they don't want to be listened or they don't want to be talked to. And while they don't have all the answers or the maturity, uh, I think we can be better guides instead of, uh, you know, dictators. Um, part of, you know, growing up, I felt like I was living in a dictatorship, you know, like right. and suddenly I had this freedom. Uh, and for young people, I would say, don't be afraid uh, to venture outside of your comfort zone. Uh, and you do have a voice, even though you feel uncomfortable, adults feel uncomfortable using their voice too. So don't feel minimized because you're young. Uh, it's important what they have to say and they should say it but it's also important to realize that divisiveness and um, marginalizing other people is not the answer uh, and if they do go down that path realize that they're being fooled because somebody else has an agenda so take control of your lives even as a young person and uh, and, and gravitate towards positivity people that are willing to lift you up instead of worrying so much about not fitting in that's amazing what do you think finally got you out of your depression? Because I, I, I thought it was interesting. I envisioned like a bear going into hibernation. It's yeah, like it's you don't know what's like, going on, but it was kind of like you were rewiring. Because it I felt was, like you came out and it, it's you had your identity crashed for like the second crashed. time. So I didn't know who I was. Uh, when I got out of the movement, I mean, I lost my wife and children. I closed my store, so I lost my livelihood. I used that as an opportunity to walk away from the movement abandoning the only family identity and, and purpose that I really knew. And your brother was kind of and my brother not wanting was, to be with you yeah, at that point. And I didn't have a great relationship with my parents, even though they tried. Uh, and, you know, I think that five years of depression uh, happened because I was trying to outrun who I was. I was so scared of being judged the same way that I judged other people that I really wanted to hide that. And I didn't, I didn't admit it. Uh, you know, I wore long sleeves to cover my tattoos. I moved. I tried to make new friends. And even though I was treating other people with, you know, great amounts of respect, I wasn't treating myself with respect. Uh, it was like a cancer was growing inside of me. And I didn't know what it was uh, until somebody, you know, who I had hurt pointed it out to me that, you know, I needed to tell my story. I needed to own it. Uh, and I needed to suffer under the weight of my past. And once I started to do that, uh, once I finally found the courage to do that, because I was scared, um, I became a better father. I became a better, you know, friend, employee. I was happier. I got out of my depression. And uh, I realized that those eight years were a learning experience for me, despite, you know, hurting myself and other people. I needed to use that to move forward. Is that when you think you got to know you for the first yeah. time, like truly who you were? Yeah. And people ask me all the time, like, you know, I don't, or they say, I don't believe you've changed. You know, there's some people, you know, even 22 years after doing this work, they don't believe I've changed. And what I say to them is you're right. I've, I haven't changed. No. I'm still that same person I was born to be. And I took a, I took a course for eight years that nearly destroyed me, but taught me everything that I know today. Uh, and I've gone back to that compassionate, empathetic, introverted, uh, you know, shy human being that I was. Uh, but now I know what my focus is. I know that I need to use that to help other people who might be in the same position. I love that. And thank you for sharing that, because I think that's what we do here. It's like try and we always say the more you know yourself, the better it all becomes and the easier life is for you. Because and like you said, you never change. It's just getting to know yourself, like exactly. sit down and get to know who you are yeah. and we said earlier, you can wear many, many hats and you can change what you do, And yeah. but who you are will never change. Yeah, and we may go through periods where, you know, we question who we are, or where we do different things and sometimes are positive, sometimes are negative. And you're a great example of that, right? You spent your whole career doing one thing and then realized that your passion was something else. You found your true self. Um, and uh, it's it's not easy. I mean, people, every person on earth struggles with this and, you know, how to find happiness, how to find meaning and, 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 you know, who, who am I? Uh, and I think we need each other like to those figure that out, yeah. you know, looking internally doesn't always help us because we have a very skewed vision of who we are. 
but listening to people who are positive and have good energy often give us really amazing insight and you know not in telling us who you we have are, to be open in, to hear it yeah you do have to be open to hear it and i didn't want to hear it during right. that time i thought i was the smartest i do was you think, ever going to be not to go but do you think there was anything let's say your junior year of high school your parents could have done or at that point, were you too far gone? I think at that point, I was too angry at my parents and resentful. Um, and I think a lot of what I did, well, you know, let me take a step back. I think if they would have been honest with me and vulnerable with me and come and said, you know, what we did maybe contributed to this, but we know you're better than that. That's the most powerful thing I think anybody's ever said to me is you're, you're better than that. Who said that to you? strangers, uh, friends, um, you know, people who I think saw something inside of me because I was a smart, uh, you know, driven young person. I was just, you know, misguided. I was misguided and I was lost. And I think when people told me that I was better than what I was doing, it kind of insulted me in a way that made me <laughs> think about what they were saying like, and like, wow, am I a hopeful insult? I, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was criticism, but at the same time, they were trying to help because they knew that this facade that I had for eight years and, and a facade that hurt people, like, I don't want to discount that. I was very committed to what I was doing, uh, but I was also hiding something and I was using it uh, as a weapon to, to cover up my own, you know, low self-esteem and self-confidence and self-loathing, really. Do you think you were lucky or was it purposeful that you never killed somebody? I think I was both. <laughs> I think I was lucky, uh, but I also was purposeful because I knew I had a good foundation. You know, despite my parents not being there, they they did instill, you know, val good values in me. And, and they set a good example for me, even though they weren't there. They weren't, you know, they didn't have vices. They weren't bad people. They didn't treat me badly. They were doing they just, the best they could. They just weren't there. You know, they were working hard. And I think I was always walking to the edge and maybe sticking my toes over it. But always knew that I knew enough to not step over the edge, though I was very, very, very close many times. Uh, and I think maybe deep down inside, I knew I was better than that. And uh, by the way, that's something to be very thankful know. to your parents for. Yeah, because that means there was an anchor always, always, always. And I'm very grateful for that. I mean, looking back now, I have the luxury of, of knowing they were just working their butts off to survive and to raise a family and that they did love me and that they did put the things in place that I should have appreciated at the time, but I didn't. We don't know how to appreciate those know. things at that age. I mean, you want to, you know, as a kid, you, you don't think about anything but yourself. You want to fit in. You don't want to be an outsider. You don't want to get picked on. That's all you worry about. You know, is my nose too big or, you know, is my breath smell? Am I too short? You know, do I have the right shoes on? It's all those things. Um, and those things don't matter. <laughs> Those things are, are, you know, that's what makes us, all of our differences are what make us beautiful. And we shouldn't want to be like everybody else or shouldn't want a, a homogenized society. Um, because at the core, we're the same. And it's all, core. like you said, it's the flourishes that make us different. And it's that's what's beautiful. It's the enhancements that, that make this world beautiful. Would you mind on that note, actually, because it reminds me of how you closed your book. And I sure. think it's so beautiful. Do you mind actually reading it for us? I would love to. So Christian's now going to do his personal practice, and he's going to read an excerpt from his book. We are part of each other, bound together by the fact that we are human beings. What becomes of the human race is everyone's responsibility, and when one of us fails, we all do. When one of us refuses to be part of what is wrong with the world, the world becomes brighter for all of us. I urge you to recognize that and to honor it in your actions and decisions. Be part of the good in the world part of the ever-growing community that seeks fairness, justice, and compassion. We all have the ability to make good happen if we just try. You are me, and I am you. Peace to us all. Thank you for letting me read that. No, oh, thank you for doing that. It's amazing to hear it come from you. You Look, thank you for, look, like you said, you did some really ugly things in your time, but thank you for taking them and channeling them and trying to change the world with it and trying to change people and, and understanding empathy and compassion and knowing that that's really what drives all of us and unites us. And those are huge lessons and you wouldn't have been able to teach them if you didn't come from where you came from. Thanks, Tal. I really appreciate that. And, and, uh, and, and thanks for believing in me. No, it's been an honor to speak with you today. And oh, likewise. thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you.